When you hear the word mummy, you might get a chill down your spine. That's because most of us associate this word with those creepy characters we've seen in some scary movies. But in reality, mummies have helped us understand a lot about ancient civilizations, their rulers, and about how people used to deal with losing their loved ones. The people most famous worldwide for their mummies are the ancient Egyptians. They believed that some sort of existence after passing away was possible, if certain conditions were met. That's why they insisted on preserving the human body through the process of mummification and placing the mummy in a furnished tomb, kind of like giving it a fully functioning apartment of its own. Why did they believe in this? Well, because they were deeply connected to their natural environment for the most part. They saw the natural cycles around them, like how the sun rose every day, followed by the moon, or how new life was always sprouting from plants, even after they had wilted away. They also believed that the powerful spirit Osiris, who represented the cycle of passing away and resurrection, played a role in this process. To prepare for the afterlife, the ancient Egyptians followed certain rituals, like mummification, which involved using materials like honey, resins, and incense to preserve the body. There's no other mummy more popular than that of King Tut. He was a young pharaoh who ruled over 3,000 years ago in Egypt. The problem with discovering ancient royal tombs is that most of such burial sites were previously robbed. People knew ancient rulers had been left with many valuable belongings, so those locations became vulnerable to thieves. When King Tut's tomb was opened in 1922, people were excited because it had not been robbed, like many other previously discovered royal tombs. That's how well hidden it was. Inside, his mummy was encapsulated in a total of three coffins, including one made of gold. The objects found in his tomb showed us what ancient Egypt was like. And studying his mummy also helped us learn about the culture and practices popular at the time when he passed away. We also learned about his family by looking at his DNA. Scientists were able to discover that he had had a disease called malaria and a problem with his foot that might have made it hard for him to walk. Ramses II was another pharaoh in Egypt who ruled for 68 years which was quite a lot back in the day. He was known for his expansion campaigns and building projects. Many objects from his time as a ruler still exist today, including a large statue of him. Ramses II was about six feet tall and lived to be about 90 years old. After looking at his mummy, scientists concluded that he may have had a medical condition that affected his spine. Now, remember those thieves I mentioned before? They are probably the reason why Ramses II ended up in a plain coffin in a secret collection of royal mummies at Deir al-Bahari, which was rediscovered in 1881. Thankfully, archaeologists were able to identify him because his journeys had been recorded on his wrappings. The process was really tedious too. In fact, in ancient Egypt, the mummification process could take a staggering 70 days to complete. A special person would say a very specific speech while delicately handling the body and drying it out using a type of salt called natron. They also used linen and resin to make the body look more lifelike and to wrap it in cloth. The tomb was equally as important for ancient Egyptians. The walls of King Tut's tomb, for example, were adorned with intricate artwork that depicted his journey to the afterlife, from his burial procession to his passage through the underworld. The ancient Egyptians believed that everyone made this journey after passing away, and they filled their tombs with items and paintings to help the person in their spiritual travels. Additionally, the walls of the tomb were decorated with spells from a special book, which contained a collection of poems that the Egyptians believed would help people reach the afterlife. And speaking of how important this journey was, people also placed food in these ancient tombs. In King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered 36 jars of vintage beverages and eight baskets of fruit, which were believed to be left there to help him in his journey to the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that traveling to the afterlife took a really long time, 
so they left a lot of supplies, such as food and water, to sustain their loved ones. Pharaohs also generally had numerous luxurious garments and beautiful jewelry in their tombs to ensure that they would have a fashionable journey. These items included various types of linen clothing, such as tunics, scarves, gloves, and headdresses, as well as a lot of gold jewelry with precious stones, like bracelets, buckles, pennants, necklaces, rings, and even precious depictions of insects for protection. Some were also deposited with fans made from ivory and ostrich feathers to keep them cool in the afterlife. Some ancient rulers were even placed in their forever apartments along with boats. For example, Pharaoh Khufu built the Great Pyramid at Giza as his tomb, and a large ship was found inside. King Tut, however, was buried with multiple boat paddles, but no actual boat. Instead, he had three chariots and numerous walking sticks made of precious materials, perhaps indicating he'd rather travel to the beyond by land, not by water. Amongst the most interesting objects found near ancient mummies are bottles of oils and perfumes. If rulers were supposed to be fashionable, why not smell nice too, right? Also, some of them had some ancient kinds of board games, most of them made out of precious materials, like gold or ivory. One of those games was called Senate. It was very popular amongst the ancient Egyptians and very similar to modern-day chess. The ancient Egyptians may have the most famous mummies out there, but they weren't the first to invent the procedure. In fact, it all started in South America with an ancient civilization named the Chinchorro. As far as we know today, these people were the first to mummify their loved ones that had passed away. They did it somewhere around 2,000 years before the Egyptians started their own rituals. Sure, we can tell a lot about ancient rulers by studying these mummies, but until recently, we had no idea what they really looked like during their lifetime. Not so long ago, though, some very special mummy paintings were found by archaeologists studying ancient Egyptian objects. These mummy portraits are highly detailed paintings of individuals that were made while they were still alive. Such paintings were often painted on wood, as opposed to the classical portraits we all know about, which are painted on canvas. They are known for their realism and beauty, and have even been used by researchers to diagnose diseases by comparing them to the corresponding mummies. Some of these portraits also include depictions of jewelry, which was later found on the mummies. The recent discovery of these mummy portraits in central Egypt is significant as it marks the first time in over a century that such paintings have been found. Mummies appeared all around the world naturally too. Mummification can occur without people intervening because of natural conditions like extremely cold or hot environments, places with a lack of oxygen, or accidental exposure to chemicals that preserve the body. These conditions don't allow bacteria to grow, resulting in the body remaining more or less intact. Famous Atsi was one of these mummies. We know today he was a man who lived around 5,000 years ago in Europe. But upon his discovery in the Alps in 1991, Austrian authorities initially believed that he was a modern mountaineer because of how well preserved the body was. However, after the Iceman was removed from the glacier, it was determined that he was actually from the Copper Age. Imagine working seven days a week on a large-scale construction site. You, along with thousands of others, carry millions of stone blocks and put them on top of each other according to a complex system. You work without modern construction equipment. You have no air conditioning or constant access to water. It's so hot outside that you can fry eggs on the road. You've been building the pyramid for decades. And now, when it's finally done, you enjoy the result of the colossal work of thousands of people. You're looking at a giant cultural monument of global value that will freeze in time and amaze people for tens of thousands of years. A few thousand years have passed, People in the 21st century see the pyramids and are like, wow, I can't believe humans have built this. Yeah, the people who built the pyramids wouldn't have appreciated such a theory. But actually, 
there are reasons to believe that people built it using some fantastic technology. From the outside, it seems the Great Pyramids are just big triangles of stone. People just put some heavy blocks on top of each other, and that's it. In fact, the design seems too perfect to be true. The pyramid consists of more than 2 million blocks. They lay so close to each other and are so even that you couldn't squeeze even a thin sheet of paper between them. Scientists still can't figure out the exact technology for building the Egyptian pyramids. One of the biggest and most famous is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This huge construction, well known all over the world, has one big secret. There should be a capstone on top of the pyramid. It's a triangular shaped stone block, a small pyramid on top of a huge one. It's also called a pyramidion. The builders of ancient Egypt made it out of granite and limestone and covered it with gold. No records or old drawings prove that there was a pyramidion at the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there's another ancient Egyptian structure with such a triangle, the Red Pyramid. It was built before the Great One, and its capstone has survived to this day. Archaeologists have found and reconstructed it. But where could the capstone of the Great Pyramid be? It's a mystery that still has no answer. Some are sure that some thieves have stolen it from the top. Maybe they just climbed up and pushed the Pyramidian down. It makes perfect sense. The capstone was probably the most valuable element of the pyramid. Many scientists and archaeologists still don't know its exact purpose. Some believe that this peak covered with gold glorified the pharaohs. The capstone reflected moonlight at night and illuminated the entire space around it. During the day, the capstone reflected sunlight with its shiny surface. You could have noticed it from afar. The top of the pyramid was a kind of guiding star for lost travelers. All other stone blocks of the pyramid consist of limestone. People polished them to make them look shiny. In the past, they were even glowing and reflected light. You could see glowing pyramids from space, although they looked like tiny lights. Over thousands of years, winds, sandstorms, and rains have changed the pyramid's appearance. If people had taken care of them all this time, they would have looked like something out of science fiction movies or the pyramids from Las Vegas. But unfortunately, we will never see their original appearance. Some archaeologists and scientists believe that the capstone could absorb the sun's energy and distribute it evenly throughout the pyramid. No one knows precisely why the Egyptians needed this technology. There's a theory the pyramids are ancient energy systems. The pharaohs applied this energy to use some unique technologies that were more advanced than all the achievements of the 21st century. And the triangular shape of the pyramids was ideal for boosting this electromagnetic energy. In theory, solar radiation, or electromagnetic forces, accumulated at the top of the pyramid, filled the inner rooms, and then went down the walls to the base. Any surface distortion could prevent the flow from spreading, so they had to create a perfectly smooth surface. That's why they installed the blocks so that nobody could squeeze a needle or razor blade between them. Many people believe in this theory because they built the pyramids from limestone. This material can hold energy inside itself. In the inner part, they created granite deposits to cause air ionization, that is, to create an electric charge. They also dug channels under the pyramid for water to transmit electricity. And at the top, they put a gold capstone, the best conductor of electricity. So this is how you get a great power generator. Different cultures used similar technologies to create electricity all over the world. But these are all theories. If it had been working, humanity would have used these technologies today. There are mentions of the metal industry, chemistry, engineering, physics, mathematics, and astronomy in some ancient records. Most scientists don't believe in all these things. We know the detailed stages of the technology's development in different cultures. 
In the 21st century, scientists, historians, and anthropologists can track the evolution of all modern devices. If people had created some technological inventions in ancient times, the history of the world would have looked different. Perhaps all the achievements of antiquity could have been wiped off the face of the earth by global cataclysms. And it can happen to us. Just imagine how people would dig up a laptop in 5,000 years. Perhaps they wouldn't understand what kind of device it is. Another Egyptian wonder surrounded by mystery is the statue of the Sphinx. The Egyptians carved it out of a single massive piece of limestone about 4.5 thousand years ago. But scientists still don't know the exact date of its construction or who built it. People painted the Sphinx in different colors, so it looked much brighter and more vivid in the distant past. It was shining just like the Great Pyramids. Anyway, time hasn't only changed its appearance, but its name too. Initially, the Egyptians called it Horemeket. The Greeks renamed it the Sphinx about a few hundred years after it had been built. The Sphinx emphasized the greatness of the rulers of Egypt. It also performed a symbolic function of a watchdog guarding the tomb of the pharaoh and the paths leading to it. This version sounds realistic, since archaeologists have discovered many secret entrances at the foot of the Sphinx. Perhaps these rooms and intricate tunnels lead to underground halls with treasures. And treasures don't always mean gold and jewelry. According to legends and theories, the Sphinx guards the Hall of Records, the storage of all humankind's knowledge. The information about the ancient mythical state of Atlantis could be there. You can find many detailed maps of the internal dungeons of the Sphinx on the internet. They show structures 12 stories deep under the statue. It looks like a small city filled with gold, scrolls of knowledge, and various ancient artifacts. But don't believe all these maps. These are just theories. Several thousand years have passed, but people have very little information about it. Archaeologists know that there are still many strange and exciting things about the Sphinx that are still undiscovered. Some locals are afraid to research because they believe they can awaken something terrible from the underground depths. Therefore, it's mostly scientists from other countries who conduct the excavations. In 1998, scientists discovered strange tunnels leading to empty rooms under the Sphinx. They realized that some people tried to get there through tunnels in the past. And maybe those people took all the treasures that were there. One of the legends says that some powerful artifact lays beneath the Sphinx. Its technology can change the whole world, but the locals are hiding it because it can damage the planet. Some believe that you can find evidence of unknown technologies painted on the granite walls in the pharaoh's tombs. But most likely, these paintings and signs tell us the myths and legends of ancient Egypt. But what if Egyptian symbols and drawings are detailed instructions for using ancient technologies? What if the locals that lived at that time thought, hmm, people in the future won't be able to get energy themselves. Let's leave some detailed instructions for them. Anyway, there are many riddles and theories. In reality, the search for answers is a dangerous undertaking, since it's not easy to get into the underground halls. Excavations can ruin the structure of the entire Sphinx. Any person inside the tunnels may get lost and never be able to find their way back. Besides, it costs a lot of money. Now what would be awesome is if people could invent some device that could scan underground areas and show their detailed models. The year is 1923. Two teenagers sneak out of their homes in the middle of the night in Florida City. Rumor had it that an old man was building a rock castle by himself. But every time someone tried to see what the old man was doing, he would stop working. The curious teens managed to sneak into Ed's backyard and saw something they could later describe as magic. They recalled seeing rocks moving around like helium balloons. The old man was moving up to 30 tons of stone by himself to build his castle. Even if he didn't allow anyone to see him working, he would proudly talk about it around the town. But whenever people asked how he was building a stone castle all on his own, he simply answered, 
I cracked the secret of the pyramids. This story begins in Latvia, Edward Liedskalnen's home country. Edward was born in a small village on January 12, 1887. He was born in a family of stonemasons, which is probably where he learned ancient techniques of building. However, he grew up as a sickly boy, which meant he could never carry much weight or undergo heavy physical activity. At the age of 26, an unfortunate turn of events determined Ed's fate. The love of his life broke off their engagement, and heartbroken Ed decided to move to the United States. He lived in a couple of American states before finally moving to Florida, where his life's adventure started. Ed spent years searching for the right spot of land to build his dream house. He always rejected good farmland. When people wondered why, he only smiled. Finally, when he bought land of his own, it was deemed terrible by his close friends. The soil was bedrock. He could neither plow nor farm it, but it seemed perfect for what he was seeking to build. Ed's close friends would often describe him as eccentric. When asked why he wanted to build a house, he would only say, It's for my sweet 16. Someday she's coming back. Then he changed the topic of the conversation. It took Ed about 30 years to finish Coral Castle, and he did it all by himself. He would only work under the cloak of night and never, never let anyone see what he was doing. The completed Coral Castle embodies a number of unsolved mysteries. If you were to visit the site back then, you'd have to go through a 9-ton, 8-foot-tall revolving gate door that even a kid could push with just one finger. Ed was so proud of this door that he originally named the site Rock Gate Park. It was renamed Coral Castle only much later, after Ed's passing. Once inside, visitors would access the incredible wonders of Ed's constructions. Towers, mystic symbols, furniture, and swing sets, all made entirely of monolithic blocks of stone. The stones are set on top of each other, using only their weight to keep them together. And believe it or not, the entire park gathers around 1,100 tons of stone. Today, if you visit Ed's living quarters, you'll even see the simple instruments he used to construct all of this. Chisels, hammers, ropes, and pulleys. The type of work he did is difficult even with modern day equipment, let alone without it. Coral Castle's main mystery lies in how Ed managed to do it. The only photograph of Ed Liedskalnin at work shows a simple leverage structure of a chain hoist attached to a wooden tripod. The tripod was made of old telephone poles with a small wooden box on top. What was in the box is, of course, a mystery. Unfortunately, he took his secrets with him, not sharing the truth of his work with anyone else. Yet, not all is lost as there are many theories and speculation surrounding what could have happened there. One theory says that there is a harmonic grid inside the Earth's surface, something that would create anti-gravity spots around the globe. It's believed that Coral Castle was built in such a spot. This could explain why it took Ed so long to find land that pleased him. Maybe what he was looking for was a place that allowed him to experiment with anti-gravity forces. Yet, whenever Ed talked about his work, he would say he understood the laws of weight and leverage, and, sure thing, that he had cracked the secret of the pyramid builders. And what secret is that, you might ask? According to Ed himself, it has to do with magnetism. He even published a pamphlet called Magnetic Current. There, he explains that every object has magnetic particles inside of them. A person just needs to understand where they are located inside such objects. This way, objects can be lifted and moved around without much effort, just like moving something heavy underwater. Researchers say that if we assume Ed Lietzkelnen and the pyramid builders used the same technique, then it would only have taken 4,700 workers to build the Great Pyramid of Giza instead of the 20,000 to 100,000 that is currently estimated. But this story just keeps on getting more and more mysterious. In the late 1920s, 
Ed was finishing the construction of Coral Castle in Florida City. Rumors about his work had spread around town. People said Ed was hiding a stash of money somewhere in his living quarters. One night, a group of men waited until Ed was alone and broke into the castle to rob him. They couldn't find the money and luckily didn't harm Ed. But in the following days, he decided that it was best he moved out of that land. Of course, he took more than his toothbrush along with him. Ed decided to move the entire Coral Castle to another land 10 kilometers away from where he had built the park. Legend says he hired a truck driver and asked him to swear secrecy about what Ed intended to do. He asked the driver to look away while Ed loaded the truck by himself, moving all of the rocks without any help. With the truck loaded, Ed and his castle moved to Homestead, Florida, where the park is located until this day. In 1986, a group of engineers from Florida University was called to try to fix the park's gate entrance, the nine-ton revolving door that Ed was so proud of. They arrived with plenty of modern-day equipment, including a 20-ton crane. When the engineers took the door down, they noticed that Ed had used a strange circular stone at the bottom of the revolving door. The engineers couldn't understand how this frisbee-sized rock could withstand nine tons of weight without breaking into pieces. They sent the rock to the geology department at the University of Florida, but the geologists simply returned the rock, saying they couldn't find a match of this rock in their databases. They couldn't determine its origin. The engineers put the nine-ton gate back into place, trying to use other techniques. At first, it didn't work without the base rock Ed had originally used. So, they had to cut the gate rock to make it work as a revolving door once again, proving that modern-day technology couldn't replicate what Ed had done single-handedly. Fast forward to 2011, and another man claimed to have cracked the code of the pyramid builders and Ed Leedskelnen himself. Wally Wallington, a retired construction worker from Lapeer County, Michigan, has managed to build using similar techniques to those used by Ed. Wallington is known for having built his personal Stonehenge in Michigan. He is said to have used simple machines such as levers and counterweights, moving around multi-thousand pound concrete blocks. Unlike Ed, Wallington has shared his techniques with the public. Multiple videos are showing the clever engineering he built from very simple materials. It sure is impressive. The man has moved his entire barn into another property just with the help of simple tools. However, there is no way to prove that these were the same techniques used to build Coral Castle. To this day, the secrets of Coral Castle haven't been unraveled. But hey, we can always keep trying to solve it. Two centuries ago, a 31-year-old Frenchman stormed into his brother's office in Paris. He had only one thing to share. I've got it! The man was so excited that he immediately collapsed. He spent the next five days in bed recovering his health. Who was this mysterious person and why was he so thrilled? Jean-Francois Champollion made one of the greatest scientific breakthroughs in human history. He had cracked the code of Egyptian hieroglyphs. This enabled scientists to finally unravel the secrets of this ancient civilization. They weren't able to read hieroglyphs for nearly 2,000 years. After the Romans took over Egypt, the intricate writing system slowly faded away from people's minds. The last of the hieroglyphic texts date back to the 4th century. For thousands of years, Egyptians used images to show their lives. But the knowledge of how to read these pictures was lost to modern science. The story of hieroglyphs began in 3250 before current era. That's when ancient Egyptians developed writing. Their motivation was to better organize the distribution and storage of goods. One of the earliest examples is a ceramic jar that had an inscription in black ink. There were two major writing systems. The first were the hieroglyphs, which literally means sacred carving. Egyptians carved hieroglyphs in stone on temples, tombs, and similar monuments for 3,000 years. They present a system of pictorial texts. 
A pictograph is a picture or a drawing that stands for an idea of a word. It's a precursor to the true writing as we have it today. For example, when Egyptians wanted to write ibis, they would draw a small image of the bird. Hieroglyphs can be found on walls. They were a formal way of writing. The other writing system was hieratic. Egyptians mostly used it when writing on papyrus. That's an early, thicker form of the paper we have today. It soon evolved into demotic. This improved version became the most common writing systems in ancient Egypt. Then, in the early 4th century BCE, Alexander the Great took control of Egypt. This was the time when the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty ruled the country. You've probably heard of the last ruler of this dynasty, Cleopatra. During her time, Egyptian Demotic and Greek were used side by side. The two started mixing, and by the year 100, a new language emerged, Coptic. It slowly replaced the ancient writing system. Only Egyptian priests used hieroglyphs for the next couple of centuries, and then their meaning was lost to history. But not forever. Arabs were the first who tried to solve the mystery of the hieroglyphs. Medieval travelers came across these strange symbols and wanted to understand their meaning. They consulted speakers of Coptic and translated texts from Greek and Latin into Arabic to break the code of the hieroglyphs. During the Renaissance, Europeans also became fascinated with the legacy of ancient Egypt. Scholars from the Old Continent believed that hieroglyphs were a group of symbols as opposed to a written language. This was all about to change in 1799. A year earlier, Napoleon, the famous French ruler, arrived in Egypt. His subordinates constructed a fort that dated back to the 15th century. Rashid, or Rosetta, was a port town in the northeast of Egypt, near Alexandria. One section of the old fortification wall contained an interesting slab inside. The stone tablet was made of a granite-like rock. It was just 40 inches high and 30 inches wide. It contained three distinctive sections of text carved into it. The letters were in three scripts and two languages, hieroglyphs, demotic, and Greek. It was a fragment of a larger ancient stella. These are upright stone slabs that are used to dedicate to a person or an event, but the one from Rosetta was damaged. Two-thirds of the hieroglyphic text on the top was missing. The bottom Greek text lacked a cornerstone. The only fully preserved section was the writing in demotic in the middle of the slab. It eventually ended up in the British Museum. The scientific community was intrigued and the race was on to decipher it. Prints and casts of the slab went out all over Europe. Scholars already knew ancient Greek, so in theory, this shouldn't have been so hard. The first people who saw the Rosetta Stone thought the process would take two weeks. In the end, it took two decades. The main issue was the fact that hieroglyphs and spoken ancient Egyptian didn't have a connection anymore. Scientists didn't know what sounds the letters on the slab corresponded to. Imagine if English disappeared a thousand years in the future. Then someone finds a tablet with the word dog. At first, they wouldn't know how to read the word or the individual letters. Even if they figured out how to pronounce the word, they wouldn't know its meaning. This is what linguists were dealing with in the case of the Rosetta Stone. The careful study of the artifact produced another find. The texts weren't direct translations of each other. They both described the same event, but in different words. It was like you saw a movie with two friends, and then all three of you wrote different reviews about it. The original text was probably in Greek, but the translators added extra words to make it sound more Egyptian. An English physician and physicist, Thomas Young, made the first great breakthrough. He knew that the name Ptolemy appeared several times in the text based on the Greek translation. This wasn't an Egyptian name, so it was impossible to represent it with a single image. 
The only way to spell out this Greek name was to use symbols that sound like it when produced. This is called transliteration, and we have it today as well. This is how foreign-sounding words are written down in Chinese or some Slavic languages. Young focused on sets of hieroglyphs in oval frames. These are called cartouches. He experimented a bit, but finally discovered that one of them read Ptolemy the Great. The individual hieroglyphs that made up this name corresponded to sounds needed to produce it. This is where our mysterious man from the beginning of the video enters the picture. Champollion picked up where Young left off. He knew Coptic, so the Frenchman was able to determine what many other hieroglyphs sounded like. The Eureka moment was close. It came while he was studying a cartouche from a site dedicated to Ramses II. It had four symbols. The last two were the same. He determined this was the sound S. The first symbol was the sun. This is Ra or Re in Coptic. So the cartouche read Ra something SS. Can you already guess the name? Of course, it's Ramses. This breakthrough finally cracked the code. Ancient Egyptian wasn't a mishmash of cool-looking images. It was a phonetic language that Jean-Francois Champollion discovered in September of 1822. The stone slab is today known as the Decree of Memphis. The Egyptian council issued it in this city in the year 196 before current era. In it, they expressed their loyalty to the pharaoh. They erected identical stelae and temples all across Egypt. The Rosetta Stone was just one copy of them, but its content is less important than the fact that Champollion's translation gave these ancient peoples their voice again. During the 1800s, European scholars didn't think that the Egyptian civilization was much older than Classical Greek or Roman. Now that scientists could read hieroglyphs, a whole new chapter of human history opened. One of the most famous finds in the history of archaeology happened in 1922. That's when the British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. The whole world admired King Tut's golden mask. But without Champollion's pioneering work, it would be impossible to know who its owner was. The young pharaoh's cartouche is phonetic. For instance, you pronounce the pictograph of a chick as the vowel U. The symbol for the key of life is an ankh, and there is a shepherd's crook in the end. It symbolizes the word ruler. It's 1898, and you're taking part in excavations in Saqqara. This place, not far away from Cairo, is full of ancient tombs and pyramids. You're in your Indiana Jones mood and hope to find something really phenomenal to become famous. Gold, manuscripts, treasure maps, mummies of famous pharaohs. Wait, a wooden bird? You're really disappointed as it looks like a regular toy. An old one, but still. Little do you know that years later, someone would propose that your bird was actually an ancient monoplane. So the artifact, nicknamed the Saqqara bird, is made of a sycamore tree. The birdie has a wingspan of just 7 inches and weighs around 40 grams. A perfect original souvenir from Egypt, I would say. It's over 2,000 years old and looks pretty plain, without any carvings of feathers or other intricate ornaments. It has a beak and eyes, though, which makes our find look like a hawk, the emblem of the deity Horus. Its tail is rather unusual as it's squared, looks weirdly upright, and it seems like the sunken part of it was the place for a now missing piece. Humans love solving a good mystery. So there have been several attempts to explain the use of the birdie. First, quite simply, is that it was a ceremonial object. The second idea is that it was a toy for a child from some well-off family. It could have been some sort of boomerang, which was a popular concept in ancient Egypt. Then there was a theory that the bird had been used as a weather vane. But this one has been debunked as the figure doesn't have any holes or markings except for the one made at the museum in Cairo to fix the exhibit on a stick. So there was no way to hang it in the past. 
Almost a century after the bird was found, Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Masiha proposed a new theory that it could have been a model of a monoplane. He believed the bird was missing a horizontal tailplane. Otherwise, it had its wings set at a right angle, similar to that of modern planes. It could have worked to generate the aerodynamic lift necessary for flights. Dr. Masiha also claimed that it was common at that time to place miniature models of technological inventions in tombs. So, did the ancient Egyptians really invent the plane in 200 BCE? That would make the Wright brothers, who are considered the inventors of aviation, really, really upset. They made one of their first flights only in 1903. There's just one way to know for sure, and that is to test the model. But you know, the ancient museum in Cairo would unlikely let one of their cherished exhibits fly around like a toy. That's why glider designer Martin Gregory built a similar model, this time of balsa wood, and concluded that even with the missing tailplane, the plane wasn't much of a flyer. Case solved? Not really. This didn't sound convincing enough to the History Channel, so they invited an aerodynamics expert to build another replica of the bird. He tested it in weather conditions similar to those in Egypt and was impressed with the little plane's abilities. So, if they did invent the prototype of a plane back in the times of pharaohs, it would be a good example of an upart. That's an out-of-place artifact, an object that's way ahead of its time in terms of technology or history. And the Saqqara bird isn't the only example of such a revolutionary concept. In 1901, a group of divers retrieved the Antikythera mechanism from an underwater shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera. It's been dubbed the world's first analog computer, and it's currently dated around 100 BCE. The bronze mechanism could tell the position of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, as well as the lunar phase, the dates of upcoming solar eclipses, and even the speed at which the moon moves through the sky. No one's sure who used it and how or where it was made. But it's obvious that it's extremely precise and way too advanced for its time. The first flushing toilets in the world were invented in the middle of the 20th century. Just kidding. The ancient Minoans on the Mediterranean island of Crete and the Indus Valley civilization both came up with this brilliant invention at the same time, around 4,000 years ago. The plumbing and sanitation were so well done that no one managed to design anything better until 2,000 years later. One ancient Minoan lavatory was discovered at the Palace of Knossos. It looks like it had a wooden seat set over a tunnel that directed water from a rooftop reservoir to an underground sewer. Other varieties got water from jugs. Only the super rich people could afford all this glory. So if you wanted to shop for real estate back then, the flushing toilet would be a telltale sign you were in the rich neighborhood. Automated doors became a cool, seemingly new invention back in 1931. But the technology behind them is actually much older. Think the first century CE old. Mathematician and engineer Heron of Alexandria came up with a hydraulic system to open and close temple doors. To bring it into action, you need to light a fire to produce heat. There was a brass pot under the fire, half filled with water. The inventor connected the brass pot to containers that acted as weights. When the fire was burning, the water moved into the containers. They went down and pulled the ropes. It was nothing like a supermarket door that opens in front of you before you even have time to think. Heron's door took hours to open, and there was no way to stop the process. That's why they only opened the doors once a day before people entered the temple to add some mysticism at the temple during ceremonies. Spooky! Looks like the first ever battery was invented in Baghdad around 2,000 years ago. A German archaeologist found this oval-shaped clay jar in 1938. Scientists are still not sure what purpose it served and who exactly invented it. 
There is a theory that it was used for electroplating objects with precious metals. When they filled it with a weak acid like vinegar, the battery produced around one volt of electricity. Another theory says it was a vessel for sacred scrolls. Would you like to buy contact lenses designed by Leonardo da Vinci himself? In 1508, he invented a glass lens with a funnel on one side. You were supposed to wear it with water inside to improve your vision. Sounds a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? So, around a century later, French scientist René Descartes decided to improve the idea and make the cornea contact the future lenses. Contacts because they contact your eyes, get it? The glass tube with liquid did help improve vision, but blinking was sadly impossible. Two and a half centuries later, new technologies in the glass industry let scientists design contacts that would fit in the eye and even let the wearer blink. Thanks, guys! Still, those lenses were made of heavy blown glass and didn't let the eye breathe. About 50 years later, contacts became plastic, lightweight, unbreakable, and scratch resistant, but still covering the entire eye. And then, in 1948, an English optical technician accidentally sanded down a plastic lens and figured out they'd still be in place even if they covered only the cornea. Imagine you're living in 19th century London and need to send a message to New York. It would have taken about 10 days to get there by ship. So when delivery time went from days to hours in 1858, it was a true sensation. The first message was sent by Queen Victoria herself. It was all made possible thanks to the transatlantic telegraph cable running under the ocean. Sadly, the new cool invention only lasted a few weeks. It took years to bring it back to life. <laughs>